The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Court TV Podcast. I'm Vinny Politan. And this week we have another episode of the Court TV original production, Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall, a true crime series that delves into the Court TV archives for stories of people victimized not by complete strangers, but instead by someone close to them. This week's episode is called Last Call and is a deep dive into a trial that we covered on Court TV in 2020. We called it the pizza delivery murder trial because the victim, Ashley Biggs, was a pizza delivery person, a single mom working hard to make ends meet. But when she never returned from a late night delivery call, police found only an abandoned building and a pool of blood at the delivery address. This episode of Someone They Knew explains how investigators figured out what happened to Ashley and more importantly, who was behind it. Here, featuring interviews with Detective Michael Hitchings of the New Franklin, Ohio Police, Nick Edwards of the True Crime Garage podcast, and Bobby Yeager of the Ohio Crime Victim Justice Center, here is Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall, Last Call. This is the Court TV Podcast. Is it fair to say that Ashley did not leave that parking lot alive? Her attacker was waiting in the shadows. She was jealous of Chad. If I told my dad what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. Investigation I didn't feel was complete because we didn't get the other person. Somebody wanted to hurt Ashley Biggs. The heartbreak of a broken family, a loss of power and control, volatile personalities and a ruthless manipulator. The anger and resentment bills as a powder keg of domestic violence is about to explode. That's what was happening outside the city of Akron, Ohio, when someone hidden in the darkness finally lit the fuse. We're a bedroom community in New Franklin. People out here live and they drive into Akron or Cleveland to work. 15,000 people, maybe. It's not like a city, even though we are a city. Everybody in the communities know each other. Ashley Biggs was one in a million. If you met her once, you'd never forget her. Ashley was the kindest, most gentle soul you could ever meet. She loved everyone. There was not a mean bone in Ashley's body. Ashley was a young girl, liked to go out and do stuff with her friends. And then she also enrolled in the Army in October of 07. My son Chad and Ashley met on a double date roller skating. They dated, I think they had their ups and downs. Ashley kind of bounced back and forth between males and female partners. Chad and Ashley were never married. She was young, around 18 when she had GC, and just not ready to be in the role of mother. She was retired from the U.S. Army, and she was working as a pizza delivery person for one of the bigger pizza franchise joints in the greater Akron, Ohio area. Wednesday, June 21st, 2012. The night's going to start off like a normal shift. It's going to be busy. There's plenty of orders coming in. The pizzas are hot. They get a call at 11.50 p.m. for a delivery in order to go out to a business address located on Turkey Foot Lake Road with specific instructions for the driver to take the pizza around to the back of the business. This will be Ashley's last run of the night. With this late hour and little to no cars on the road, the late night crew expects Ashley to return rather quickly she's not returned and the crew is becoming concerned and the manager is the one that places the call. I was called in the evening by a supervisor that of a missing female by the name of Ashley Biggs. That she had delivered a pizza to a local business that was closed down. She did that and then she never returned back to the pizza delivery. Relatively quickly, the deputies are on scene. They're going to go where the delivery was scheduled for. When we showed up at the original scene, there was evidence that there was a struggle there. They don't find Ashley. They don't find her vehicle. 
What they do find is a large amount of blood on the pavement. They also find skid marks. You could tell that somebody had been lifted up and put into a vehicle, and that vehicle driven away. When you're arriving on scene, as an investigator, what you are seeing and what your experience is telling you is that something very personal happened here. The police find cash at the scene, so this will be an indicator to them that this wasn't some kind of botched robbery. This looks like we have a situation where it's personally motivated. Ashley was targeted. Everything that's taken place up to this point is deliberate and planned. Somebody wanted to hurt Ashley Biggs. They found her body inside of her car in a cornfield in Wayne County. When they arrive on the scene, an officer approaches the vehicle. He can see through the window that there is a female wearing a pizza franchise shirt. She was laid down in the back seat, face up in her vehicle. She was zip tied from her legs all the way to the top of her arms. There are some kind of taser wires coming off of this individual. Ashley's blood was on the passenger side dashboard, which indicated somebody else was driving that vehicle, most likely. Told me someone obviously had to do this and drag her up into that car. They tased her, beat her, and strangled her with the industrial zip cords, placed her in the back seat of her vehicle, using her own vehicle to transport the body. It was a very violent death. I'll never forget that night. I was actually a uh, third shift caregiver at a nursing facility and a friend from our group called me to let me know that Ashley was missing. I think I probably paced a hole in my work floor just trying to keep myself moving. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew that what we had always suspected had finally come to fruition. It is shocking. You never want to believe that the worst can happen until it does. Regardless of how much you prepare for something or how seated you think you are for it, when that sh hits, you're shell-shocked. Investigators on the scene quickly deduce that what happened in that darkened parking lot was deeply personal. It doesn't take long for them to come up with a prime suspect and get hot on his trail. Police immediately identify at the ambush scene that this is probably a personally motivated attack, that somebody set this girl up. From what information we learned about it from Ashley's friends, there was a pretty bad relationship between Chad Cobb and Ashley. That made us think that there was something wrong there that, you know, it could have been him. So that's why we kind of zeroed in on him first. And they learn that she's been in this contentious and costly custody battle with her ex-boyfriend, Chad Cobb. Chad is a dad, first and foremost. He loved his kids. Chad didn't date a whole lot. His main concern was raising GC in the winter of 07. He met Erica. Subsequently, they had two more children together. They did get married. Erica had once told me that she was jealous of Chad and GC's relationship. Erica knew this going into the relationship, that they had a nice bond, and she didn't like that bond. Ashley did talk to me about the relationship between her and Chad, and it was very tumultuous. He, from the get-go, was not kind to her. He was physically, emotionally abusive. We saw her demise coming and he made it very clear that if she ever tried to take their daughter from him, he would hunt her down. After their split, Ashley chose to live her life in the gay community as a lesbian. He didn't like that she was dating women, and he didn't like that there was the idea of having their daughter around that. When Ashley did have visitation with GC, there were times Ashley would pick her up and there would be multiple females in the vehicle. He felt that it was sick. He made many threats. He told her that she would never get their daughter, that she would be dead before she touched her, and that she didn't have the right to be a part of their daughter's life. Chad had spent money 
on the attorney. Wasn't really getting anywhere. It was just tearing the rest of the family apart. It would appear to me that Chad Cobb was looking for a way for this custody dispute to end. He didn't want to spend any more money or time on this issue. Ashley Biggs, from what we can see coming out of the courts, she had to be afraid of Chad Cobb. She took out several restraining orders against him. At one point, he put a GPS tracker, supposedly, on her car to kind of track her whereabouts and things like that. So that kind of spiked us up to say, let's try to find him. They find her vehicle, but it's also less than three miles from Chad Cobb's home. They find Chad Cobb out hiding in the woods, covered in blood. They catch him red-handed. He was hiding behind his grandfather's garage. He had got out and wandered into the woods. He was wearing full camouflage gear, a hunting knife, had a taser. Duct tape strips were on his clothes, zip ties, everything he needed pretty much as an assault kit. I just don't think it was thought through well, well. And I think he panicked and left all that stuff lay there. And kind of it kind of gave it to us on a silver platter at that point. We arrested Chad that day, kind of turned himself in. He didn't have anywhere to go. It takes a little bit of time for Chad Cobb to confess to killing Ashley Biggs. He was not very cooperative following his arrest, but he's going to be indicted by a grand jury who is going to let him know that he's going to be facing the death penalty. And now he's willing to talk. He ended up pleading and taking a plea to it. He confessed to the crime. Most of the time when we are looking at a case where a man kills his wife, ex-wife or ex-girlfriend, they make an arrest, he confesses to the murder, lock him up for life. That's the end of the story. Not here, not in this case. Investigation I didn't feel was complete because we didn't get the other person. Wholeheartedly, we believed that there was a female involved and that somebody else helped him by making the phone call. Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. Chad Cobb is almost immediately arrested, pleads guilty, and is sentenced to life in prison for the violent murder of Ashley Biggs. But veteran police investigators strongly believe he didn't act alone. The problem for them is they don't have proof. And while Chad Cobb sits in prison year after year, he's still not talking. When you talk about getting the whole story, even when we have a killer that confesses to an attack and a murder, you have seasoned detectives who have this nagging, nagging feeling that, you know what, we may have got our guy, but we don't have the whole complete story here. There's something else going on. Investigation I didn't feel was complete because we didn't get the other person. Wholeheartedly, we believed that there was a female involved. We were thinking definitely that somebody else helped him by making the phone call and most likely obviously driving him there because he couldn't have drove both cars out. The person that placed the call for that pizza that night that ultimately sealed the fate of Ashley Biggs was a female voice on the phone. The call didn't come from Chad Cobb. Naturally, the detectives are going to suspect his wife, Erica Cobb. When I came in contact with her at the house, first thing Erica said was she didn't want to talk to us out with an attorney. Most people, I would say, would be concerned a little for somebody who's missing. She had no emotions, didn't want to talk about it. So that kind of steered me to believe she was involved from the get-go. A detective is going to want to know why, when they found Chad Cobb out running around hiding in the woods, why his wife and children are in an SUV that's hiding behind a garage on his grandparents' property. Why is his wife in such close proximity to him, the murder victim, and her vehicle and the ambush site? There would be days where I would just go out and follow her to see where she would go to. She ended up going to one of her husband's best friend's houses. Erica moves on very quickly. Chad Cobb, he's put away. Lock him up. He's going away for life. But Erica, very quickly, she has Christopher Michael Stefanko, Chad Cobb's best friend, move into the house with her and the kids. She got really friendly with Chad's best friend. She was 
pregnant before Chad ever got sentenced. Not too long after that, we have a divorce and we have Erica getting married. And at some point, it becomes difficult for Chad to see any of his kids. It seems like he had a lot of love for these kids and losing them and not being able to see them was the final straw for Chad Cobb. Oh yeah, he was pissed. Chad has always been there for his kids. He was allowed to by the courts to be able to see them. Erica chose not to and, and cut him out. Chad ended up talking to us. He said that she had her part to do. He had his part to do. He lets the detectives know, hey, my ex-wife, Erica, she was involved in this. Chad Cobb told us that Erica was the one who made the phone call to order the pizza in that evening. She had just as much to do with it as he did, even though he is the one who physically killed her. There was also a recording, a recording that was made by Chad Cobb's mother. I put a recorder out. We talked for a few hours, and then she had stated that she made the phone call to deliver the pizza. After years of taking the rap on his own and stewing in prison, Chad Cobb is fed up. He finally implicates his former wife, Erica Stefanko, in the killing of Ashley Biggs. She's charged with aggravated murder. Ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with opening statements. The state of Ohio does have the burden to prove each element in this case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here today to hold this defendant, Erica Stefanko, accountable for what she did on June 21st, 2012. We are here to hold her responsible for the actions she chose to take that day. Whether you hold Erica Stefanko accountable as the principal actor or as an accomplice, all roads lead to the same place. Once you see the evidence and the testimony, all roads lead to Erica Stefanko being found guilty. This murder of Ashley Biggs could not have happened if Erica Stefanko and Chad Cobb did not work together. It was planned together, and it was carried out together. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state is confident once you hear the evidence, you will find Erica Stefanko, the defendant, guilty. This case has its genesis in a custody battle. So Mr. Cobb develops in his own mind a plan. And that plan is, I know how I'm going to make sure I get custody. I'm going to eliminate the mother. She gets to that parking lot. And there only Chad Cobb. He then stands in front of a judge and admits that he beat and strangled and was guilty of aggravated murder of Ashley Biggs. He never mentions that he has an accessory. He never mentions Erica Stefanko's name. After eight years now, he's stewing in that prison he wants to get out of prison early. He wants his sentence shortened. Listen to every side of the story. And at the end, ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced you will find that Erica Stefanko is not guilty. Thank you. I am Dr. Lisa Kohler. I am the chief medical examiner for the county of Summit. So the next slide is going to be evidence of the ligature strangulation. There is a 
photograph that shows the zip tie present around her neck. So what is the significance of that? There's been some deep trauma to the neck. She has injuries around where the ligature is, where there are some abrasions, which likely are her attempting to dig at the ligature itself and remove it. She does have injuries on the backs of her hands, which would be what we would classify as a defensive type wound where somebody is trying to fend off another individual. Were you able to determine which of the findings would have been inconsistent with life? The ligature around her neck would be a lethal injury. It's going to be very difficult for the defense to put together a good defense that's going to sway a jury the way they want to sway them because the jury's going to see a child on the stand. We would call GC. GC, if you don't mind, if you would raise your right hand. GC actually had a lot of involvement in this matter. Her mother was murdered when she was just seven years old, and her biological father and her stepmother are the two that were charged with the murder of her mother. Under Ohio law, GC meets the definition of victim. We did not find out about the abuse that Erica was doing until after Chad was incarcerated. We tried to get GC into counseling early on, and that's actually where we found out about the abuse. GC wanted to be heard. GC said, you know what? I want to testify in person. She wanted Erica Stefanko herself to hear, this is how I feel, and this is what you did. What types of things are we talking about that you're remembering? She was mentally abusive and physically. And how was she mentally abusive? She would tell me that if I told my dad what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. And you said physically. So what was the physical type of abuse? I remember she would hold me on the ground, and she would hit me. And then she also before made me eat dog feces. Do you know why she made you eat dog feces? Because she was jealous of my relationship with my father. It took a lot of guts for that kid to get up and testify because she was standing in front of Erica. Testimony from child victims in particular, it kind of cuts both ways. You'll have some jurors that will say, oh, this is a child. They're not fully developed. Maybe their perceptions aren't clear. I don't know if they can remember everything correctly, especially in this case with GC being 15 at the time of trial and seven when the incident occurred. Do you remember your mother's death? I remember it happening, yes. Okay. Do you remember that there was a custody battle over you? I don't remember the custody battle. Whenever I talk with any of my clients about testifying in, in a courtroom, I, I give a lot of the same advice. With GC, it was just make sure whenever you're asked any questions, all you have to do is tell the truth. If the uh, answer is, I don't remember, if that's the truth, that's the answer. You said you remember when she died. Do you have any recollections of that night? Yes. Do you have a memory of Erica making a phone call? Yes. Tell us about the phone call. I can remember her, and I remember hearing it, but not seeing it. And I know she ordered a pizza, and I can remember that she did not use her name. Do you remember what name she did use? No. She was there when Erica placed the phony pizza order. She said, not only did my father kill my mother, but I was witness to some of the murder plot. GC, I'm gonna ask you a couple, I'll say sensitive questions. Do you know why your dad is in prison? Yes. Why is that? Because he did some not so nice things. I'm sorry, ma'am. Because he did some not so nice things. If a defense attorney seems to be a little overly aggressive with a victim while they're testifying, especially a child victim, my spidey senses are tingling, so to speak. I'm, I'm watching for it. You are not going to bully my client, and you are not going to go after this kid on the stand. 
Is it your understanding that he did some not so nice things to your mother? Yes. Do you still love your dad? Yes, I do. Would you like to see him get out of prison soon? Yeah, he's my, yes, he's my dad. This defense attorney did his job, but had enough respect for the situation and knowing that going after this kid is not gonna help his client in any way. Do you think by being here that you're helping your dad get out of prison? No, this isn't his case. I'm sorry, miss. No, this isn't his case. I don't think the fact that GC was a child testifying was the clincher in the whole thing. I think it was just one puzzle piece to help connect the dots of all the other evidence that the prosecution had. Who does the state wish to call as its next witness? Call Chad Cobb. Is it fair to say that Ashley did not leave that parking lot alive that night? For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. The defense claims that all of this is the result of a bitter Chad Cobb wanting revenge and retribution for his ex-wife, Erica, leaving him and moving on with her life. The prosecution calls Cobb himself to the stand via remote video from the prison where he is serving a life sentence. He tells his side of the story. But will the jury believe a convicted killer? Who does the state wish to call as its next witness? Call Chad Cobb. Chad Cobb. He testified today from the correctional facility where he is located, spending the rest of his life, no possibility of parole. He was testifying via the internet. After that conversation, did you stay there at the tree with Erica, or yes. did one of you leave the tree? Erica left and walked back over to the Lincoln. So when she walked over to the Lincoln, what did she do? She made a phone call. What? Did you hear Erica say on that phone call? I remember her saying somebody else's name, and I remember she ordered a pizza. Where were you when Ashley got out of the car? I remember I was somewhere on the other side of the parking lot. I was approaching and made myself known. And how did Ashley respond when she saw you there? Worked up. At the end of the day, there are three people that know what happened. Chad Cobb knows what happened. Erica Stefanko knows if she was involved or not. And the third person is not here to tell us her side of the story. Is it fair to say that Ashley did not leave that parking lot alive that night? Yes, sir, that is accurate. If I would have cooperated with the state and gave them the information that they saw, I don't know what would happen, Erica, because I can't understand why she was able to walk out of the police station the same day that we both were put in there. I mean, I got hauled off to jail, and she walked right back into the home of everybody and everything that I love. What stays with me about this case is the uncertainty. Is Chad Cobb simply upset and angry that his ex-wife moved on with her life, and he's stuck behind bars for the rest of his? Does he start bringing all this stuff up then for that reason and that reason only? Is it fair to say that you and your family still hold out hope of you getting out of prison? I would say it's fair to say that. Is it fair to say that your mother, Cindy Cobb, also holds that hope? Yes, sir. Chad's mother came to us years after we arrested Chad. In 2018, it was brought to our attention. She had a recording that Erica confessed to making this phone call and having knowledge of the details and things that nobody else would know about the homicide. Cindy Cobb holds on to this recording for a couple of years. Chad Cobb sits in prison behind bars, knowing all this time that his ex-wife, who's taken up with his best friend, was involved in this murder as well. But nobody says anything. Attorney O'Brien, how would you like to proceed? 
Judge, at this point in time, we have Christopher Michael Stefanko here. What kind of mother is Erica Stefanko? An amazing, loving, and extremely caring mother. Did Chad ever threaten Ashley? He made a comment that when it was all said and done, that he wanted to keep her skull as a trophy. Chad started slowly with the abuse, whether it was tearing her down or, you know, he'd strike her and then apologize. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I was angry. From the time I met her, she spoke of her fear of him. The early morning hours of June 21st, 2012. Did you have any contact with Chad? Uh, I spoke with him on the phone. Between what hours? Uh, I believe three and five in the morning. The uh, sun wasn't even up yet. Do you remember what Chad said to you? The uh, the very first thing out of his mouth was, I up. Attorney LaPrenzi, who do you wish to call? We call Cindy Pop. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony or statement you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God? I do. I testified about the phone call, which GC stated all along, and it's in her counseling records, that she overheard Erica make the phone call. You made a recording? Yes, sir. Who was there when you made that recording? Just Erica and I. Where was the recording made? In our barn. You believe that you made the phone call She's admitting that if everybody would have seen everything the way it went, they would both be in prison. That was one of her quotes, I believe, inside this tape. How could she know that if she didn't know the plan? Do you know? I do not know the answer to that. Erica walked out of the police station, I am told by the prosecutor, without even giving a statement. I'm thinking she's the mastermind. So then she tells you after that, now GC has a chance at a life. Correct. All this in the context of your son getting ready to give up his rights. Yes. And she's explaining to you how she wasn't going to let him do that. Yes. Do I feel bad about what happened to her? Even the moments that she went through before her life ended? Attorney O'Brien, you may proceed with cross-examination. Now, Chad is your only child. Is that a fair way of putting it? Correct. If Chad went to trial and lost, a jury could have recommended the death penalty. Yes, sir. Now, Chad pled guilty, and he was sent to prison. Soon after he went to prison, he filed an appeal, even though he just to save his life, he pled guilty. Yes, sir. This case had its genesis in a fierce custody battle. Would you not agree? Yes. Chad wanted to go to trial, wanted to tell the story, didn't want to see this happening to another family. But he was also told at that time that his trial had to be closed by a year's anniversary date. If it was not, all of the children would all be placed up for adoption and none of us would ever see them again. So at one point in time, he takes responsibility for the murder of Ashley Biggs. And then a short time after he goes to prison, 
he changes his mind? I can't speak for his actions. Is it safe to say that you don't like Erica Stefenko? After what's transpired, that'd be fair. Right. As much as you're trying to support on me for him, you didn't say it, but I feel like in the back of your head, you still want me blaming you for it. Which, I mean, it's not unreasonable, but it's still going to put me in a comfortable spot to be here. You're hoping some way, somehow, to get Chad out of prison, is that correct? I would hope to one day. You're still willing to do just about anything legal to help get him out of prison or at least get his sentence reduced. Is that a fair thing to say? I think any parent would do that. Going through the trial with Erica Stefanko, hearing the facts, seeing the photos, there was a lot we had never seen and there were things that we hadn't heard. It was like losing Ashley all over again. It was that gripping feeling of she's really gone. I'm sorry. Nine years after Ashley Biggs' brutal murder and Chad Cobb's conviction, a jury is now poised to decide whether Erica Stefanko played a role in the crime or if, as the defense claims, she's yet another victim of Chad Cobb's vengeance. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard all of the testimony and evidence. We are now in a place where we will proceed with closing arguments. So at this time, counsel will be prepared to proceed. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here to hold Erica Stefanko accountable for the actions she chose to take on June 20th through June 21st, 2012. Now, whether you all hold her responsible as the principal or as the accomplice, it all leads to the same place. All roads lead to Erica Stefanko being guilty of the crimes charged in the indictment. Chad Cobb could not have committed the murder of Ashley Biggs by himself. She drove Chad to the crime scene. She knew why it was going to happen. It was that custody battle. It was retaliation. She made the call that lured Ashley Biggs to her death. She followed Chad to the cornfield. She waited at that cornfield for him to dump Ashley's body and the car. Went back to the initial crime scene with him to clean up the evidence and hid with Chad at his grandparents' house where they actually were caught by the police. She committed this murder with Chad Cobb. She was there with him every step of the way, from the beginning, the planning, from the middle, the execution, and the end, the potential cover-up. The state is confident that you will find the defendant, Erica Stefanko, guilty of all the crimes charged in the indictment. Thank you very much. Attorney O'Brien? Correct, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the Supreme Court justices of the United States said many years ago that cross-examination was the greatest determiner of the truth that we have in our judicial system. What you heard early on in the cross-examination of Chad Cobb speaks volumes. When Chad Cobb was asked, did you and Erica plan to kill Ashley Biggs? And what was his answer? One word, no. He didn't hesitate. He said, no. This is the state's witness. Now, I'm not going to pick on a 15-year-old, but let's talk a little bit about GC right now. When this incident happened, she's seven years old. Eight years later, comes into this courtroom and describes with unusual detail about this phone call. Yeah, go ahead and come around. The Yet, 
she tells us she was asleep the rest of the time. I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, that children of any age group are susceptible to influence. I submit to you that Erica Stefenko is a scapegoat of Chad Cobb. He wants to use her to get out of prison. What's his motive? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't thought of it by now, it's real simple. It's revenge. It's my understanding that the jury has reached a verdict. Regarding count 15, the jury has found the defendant, Erica Stefanko, guilty of the offense of aggravated murder. The jury says that Erica Stefanko is guilty, that she was involved in this premeditated murder that resulted in Ashley Biggs' death. Ms. Stefanko, the jury has found you guilty of the charges as articulated on the record. The two responsible parties are in prison. Sure, Chad Cobb can be a loving father. How much do you love your daughter when you kill her mother? That's where those two bypassed everybody else. They didn't care about all or any of these other people. They wanted things their way. And when they couldn't have it their way, they were willing to do anything they could to change that. It's a terrible crime. At any time somebody loses their life, Chad does deserve to do time for his part in the crime. But also when you look at other incidences where people have lost their lives and what has been done, for him to get life without parole, I think is harsh. When cases like this, I say nobody ever wins. The dad's in prison for life. Mom's going there for 30 years. The children are with different parents now, grandparents, but they never get to grow up with their own biological parents now because of the decisions they made. So I don't think that's fair to the kids. You know, that's, that kind of sticks with you. GC asked that I share this for uh, her part of her story. <clears throat> Through everything I've chosen, the path that is right for me, and I have let the people in my life that I know want to be in my life and benefit my future. Anyone that I choose to have in my life will be by my own choosing. I've gone through tragedy and survived to be a strong young person that does my own fact finding to make my own decisions and has the strength and knowledge to be able to stand on my own two feet. I feel safe after experiencing the outcome of Erica's sentencing, knowing that the world will be one person safer for at least a few decades. My father and I both know the tragedy she has caused and there's still a lot to be told. I would like for her daughter to know that Ashley loved her very much in fact, Ashley died fighting to be with her. She lost her life because she loved her daughter so much. If you are being abused, there is help. No matter how many times that person threatens you and tells you that no one will be there for you, there are people who will be, and please reach out, don't stay silent because those who remain silent are those who lose their lives. Erica Stefanko was sentenced to life in prison. She is appealing her conviction. Chad Cobb will remain behind bars for the rest of his life. Some of Ashley's friends now work to keep her legacy alive by providing help for those suffering from domestic violence. If you're a victim of abuse, we urge you to contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. It's completely confidential, and they can help you find a way to safety. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. There you have it, another edition of Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall. If you're interested in learning more about the trial of Erica Stefanko, you can watch Court TV's Gavel to Gavel coverage in the Trials on Demand section of our website. Check the show notes for a link to the trial. 
If you have a digital antenna, you probably get Court TV, so don't forget to rescan that antenna to get access to the best legal coverage out there. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.